Welcome to Roundabout Oxford, a podcast from the University of Mississippi Libraries. As mask mandates drop and the world continues to settle into a new normal, we want to take an episode to reflect on how some of our routines and services have evolved throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. While it has undoubtedly been a traumatic time, this has also given us an opportunity to innovate and empathize in new ways. That's the silver lining we aim to focus on in this episode. First, we have Brian Corrigan, who spoke to Alex Langhart about adapting student health services here at the University of Mississippi. Then, Alex Watson interviews Kate Santayas about career life balance in the midst of COVID. My name is Brian Corrigan. Uh, I am a library specialist in continuing resources and acquisitions. And today, I'm here with Alex Langhart. Alex, can you introduce yourself and tell us your job title and what that job entails? Absolutely. Happy to be here today. My name is Alex Langhart, and I am the Director of University Health Services for the University of Mississippi. So this encompasses both student and employee health on campus. So to give our listeners a little context, it is February 8th, 22, uh, two years after the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, How has the work of University Health Services evolved over the last two years? Oh, it became a lot more intensive. You know, student employee health should be pretty straightforward, right? So acute care, wellness visits, health promotion, uh, but toss the first pandemic in over 100 years, and you're definitely going to be challenged in ways you never expected. You're dealing with constantly changing data and information, so your target metrics keep moving as new information arises. And from our standpoint on campus, we essentially became our own little department of health for our population. So we were looked to as the subject matter experts. And I believe moving forward, we, and when I say we, I mean student employee health centers on campuses everywhere, will have our value better realized. Um, Our operations get glossed over a lot uh, by our population. And it's my opinion that we have a critical role in operations supporting the missions of academic institutions. Teamwork is the key though. There were so many unknowns in the beginning So you relied heavily on your team. And I luckily have uh, one of the best teams around in student employee health. I know I'm a little biased, but they are absolutely fantastic. And then also, uh, I'd be remiss not to mention that support from upper administration is absolutely critical. And we received tremendous support uh, from student affairs, the provost office, and the office of the chancellor. You know, student health in general uh, was new to me. I had more familiarity with the employee health operational side coming from a city county hospital. So student health was brand new. And then, you know, my work anniversary being uh, at the start of the pandemic um, was just very challenging. So it was was very happy to have the support to be able to make it through. You talked about some of the data-driven decision-making and the fluid nature of the situation over the last couple of years. Um, What can you tell us about how that decision-making process works? Uh, Who's involved and what uh, some of the metrics are that are being looked at. Yes. So I learned that it works with constant reading, communication with colleagues, and a lot of coffee. (laughs) You know, know, uh, uh, my wife, Maura, she brought me a cup of coffee every day uh, the first semester of the pandemic. (laughs) And uh, she's my absolute rock. And that that helped me get, get through because, I mean, it was just a constant stream of data that we were having to review and reaching out to our colleagues uh, at other universities and, of course, the Department of Health. So for the university, these policy changes and that decision-making process was uh, very extensive. Um, I I think university leadership did a fantastic job of putting the right people in the room, and that included students, faculty, and staff. So there are still currently multiple committees reporting up to one large committee, And they cover every facet of the university that has been or could be impacted by COVID-19. So these multidisciplinary teams are working through protocols, messaging, academic continuity, et cetera. Um, And and like I said earlier, this is in conjunction with open communication lines with the hospital here, uh, Mississippi Department of Health, the city county, and then our other universities across the nation. And when we talk about that data-driven process and what what metrics are helping shape those policy decisions, you know, there there really is no single data point uh, that will determine whether we need to implement 
additional measures. It's a number of factors, uh, basically affecting our ability to address the needs of our population. You know, whether that be current cases, uh, mitigate risk in general for our campus, and then managing those resources uh, that we need to respond. So that would be looking at total cases, hospital resource strain, spaces for isolation, quarantine, testing capacity, you know, just a whole number of, of different things that we're looking at. And I think it's also very important to note that no decision is made in a vacuum. Uh, the, the people serving on these committees uh, dedicated so much time, effort, resources um, to making the right decision for our university. You know, I remember going from basically flying blind at the very beginning to where, you know, we have vaccines and treatment options available to us all. Uh, you know, in the beginning, public health professionals responded in the only way they knew how from prior experiences. So quarantine, isolation, contact tracing, uh, social distancing, these were all novel terms that the layperson had rarely heard or used, especially in this context. So there was a steep learning curve for everyone. And while we didn't have vaccines or treatment options available early on, that's when we saw this reliance on masking, social distancing, and hand hygiene. And now that we have vaccines and treatment options, it's been such a game changer. Uh, remember, too, that these mitigation efforts have always depended on what the virus is doing. And so how is it mutating? How virulent is it? Um, and as it becomes less virulent, we start to shift from some of these previous strategies and rely more on vaccines and treatment instead of social distancing, uh, just as an example. So we are entering what many are, are, are stating is, is the beginning of the endemic phase of this, this virus. Back then, when this all first went down, access to resources was the greatest challenge, in, in my opinion, just from my experience here. I remember when this all hit the fan around spring break 2020, we had to rely on the generosity of bad small hospitals to provide us testing kits. Uh, we were furiously working with reference labs to execute contracts in order to secure testing and acceptable uh, result turnaround times. I mean, you know, there was a time there where most results were getting back within six or seven days, which was just unacceptable. Um, and even rapid antigen tests were, were still novel and, and hard to get your hands on. Proper PPE was rare and, and in most cases back order. And it was nerve wracking because we needed these resources to not only take care of our population here on campus, but to keep our staff here at the health center safe while performing all these services. Now, thinking about challenges now, you know, there is a broken trust of public health. I think politics and social media have really impacted how people view public health response and professionals. You know, we live in an age where Joe Nobody can amass a following on social media and so doubt into what world-renowned scientists and medical doctors are putting out there. This is now an unfortunate reality, and uh, government and public health agencies must work to rebuild that trust, and they can't afford any communication miscues. Um, and I never thought I'd see the day when people would call for the dismantling of the CDC and dismiss their guidance. And that's a lot of fringe theory, but it's still, you know, I never thought I would actually see that in writing or on any type of news channel um, saying that. And then, you know, as we're talking about mitigation measures just in general, uh, as you know, we've here on campus have had testing capacity at student employee health. We're continuing to do that. Uh, we also set up the free PCR testing available at the depot on campus six days a week. And uh, our providers are uh, helping prescribe medications that can help alleviate symptoms during the course of the virus if you become positive. And uh, the great thing too is, is that we have pharmacy right here in house. And so you can pick that up before you leave or even uh, a lot of employees have taken advantage of them delivering it to their office. I don't know if a lot of people know about that, but uh, it's, it's a great service that we have. You know, we, we, we continue to be a, a one-stop shop for all health needs, not, not just COVID. Talk a little bit more about testing, the role of testing, uh, why it's so important now and uh, the role you expect it to play going forward. Yeah, I think you know, everything's changing constantly. So as you, we shift to this endemic phase, I foresee testing for COVID as testing for the flu. When you're symptomatic or exposed to someone, you know, that allows for quick treatment or prophylaxis. 
So when you see a lot of these surveillance testing programs, other things, I think that's going to transition more to being carried out by health departments, uh, partnering with certain clinics or hospitals, which is what they currently do now for flu. And that's just to help detect what's circulating out there for, for flu, um, you know, whether it's A or B and what actual subtype it is uh, so that they can better make the flu vaccine uh, to combat it. So, um, you know, at the beginning, there was so much emphasis on testing uh, and, and rightly so because of the contagiousness and the severe outcomes of COVID that we needed to get in front of it. So I, I think as the virulence weakens, we will see, see it handled more like we do flu currently in this nation. But, you know, I always have the disclaimer that, you know, new variants are always a threat, you know, just like flu A, you know, which that always has the potential to cause an influenza pandemic. But uh, I hope we can avoid that for at least the next 100 years or so. Uh, what do you think are the most important lessons learned from the pandemic experience as far as healthcare is concerned? Has anything positive come out of it that might not have happened otherwise? You know, that's a great question. I think um, as far as important lessons learned, we haven't learned from our history. You know, you go back to previous plagues, uh, the plague of Justinian, the great mortality of the 14th century, and even the great influenza of 1918. It seems that we just keep repeating history in regards to response. They were still dealing with misinformation, mistrust, uh, public rejection of mitigation efforts, um, and then the lackluster prep for the future. You can't cut funding to your uh, public health entities. Um, you know, we have the toolkit. We know what works and what hasn't worked in the past, and we just need to get to the point where we get that better funding, collaboration, education, and communication. Look, we have amazing scientists and medical professionals, and, and I know that we can accomplish this. We just need to make it more of a priority moving forward. Some positive outcomes that unfortunately were negative impacts for us, um, you know, that you could see there's a silver lining for is that we as a nation got a reality check on the lip service for certain health issues uh, that we like to talk about a lot. For example, the health disparity gap widened and was put on full display. You know, remember, especially at the beginning when COVID-19 and still probably if you look at the data has unequally affected many racial and ethnic minority groups and then more at risk of getting sick and dying from COVID-19. Mental health, another great example, you know, it, it needs to be addressed in a different way. And I think the pandemic seems to have been a catalyst uh, for, for change and, and awareness for, for these two um, health issues that we're facing now as a nation. And then something just off the top of my head that, you know, I think has been such a positive light is that the sky's the limit for future medical breakthroughs. Um, this has been propelled uh, by the advancement in technology and, of course, the willingness of industries to embrace the technology in new ways. You know, this ingenuity was a result of necessity, and I think it will only benefit us uh, for the future. You know, just think of how far mRNA technology has come and, and what it could possibly mean for current diseases that we're struggling with now and then anything in the future. Telehealth has uh, really been um, a godsend, especially for uh, rural health communities and those that um, you know, I even saw in the Delta where you would have to travel 45 minutes uh, just to get to your clinic appointment. Uh, of course, we got to work on our broadband coverage, but the idea that you can meet with the physician or a nurse practitioner or, or a nurse um, in the comfort of your home on, a, on, a, on a, a device. And now, as you see with the University of Mississippi Medical Center, using telehealth to actually monitor certain metrics at home, whether it's blood pressure or um, medication compliance, or even, you know, some even have the EKG uh, capability. Um, it's just so much better data and, and access uh, for these populations. And we've definitely taken advantage of it here. And I think uh, really from the employee side, employees have really enjoyed being able to just, you know, zoom in to uh, Dr. Gispin or Dr. Spears and uh, have a quick visit. You know, a, a lot of good things. Um, on the horizon as we were, we're learning from this experience and hopefully we can use those tools and new mitigation efforts that um, we've seen throughout this process to uh, push us into the future and, and take better care of our health and well-being. You know, so there are little things that 
I think we picked up along the way that are going to benefit us in the long run. Pandemics are a very real threat. Um, it's not a matter of if, but when. And as, as humans, as we saw, we were not ready uh, for what SARS-CoV-2 brought. And um, we need to invest more in our public health response. We need to work on our education of that and emphasize preventive health and wellness, especially mental health. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I think more academic institutions will see the value of campus health centers and push more resources their way. My name is uh, Alex Watson, and I am a research and instruction librarian and associate professor here at the University of Mississippi. And why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself as well, Kate? Hi, I'm Kate Santayas. I'm an associate professor of anthropology and Latin American studies in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and the Croft Institute here at the University of Mississippi. And we're talking about one of the additional responsibilities that you have here at the university, specifically for the Career Life Balance Center. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the Career Life Balance Center for those who aren't familiar with it? Sure. So the goal of the center is to provide resources to all faculty and staff um, to have uh, a more engaged life, both inside and outside of the classroom. So that includes things like support for volunteer opportunities or ideas, help finding housing, um, not explicitly help finding housing, but links to, you know, places to go, links to the career life navigators who um, can provide confidential information and discussion to both um, candidates for jobs and current folks on campus if there's an issue around, say, how to tell your supervisor, you may need to take medical leave or, or whatnot, and that's completely confidential. But the goal is really to recognize all employees as people who have lives outside of work and who should be supported in achieving their goals, both inside and, and, and outside of the, the boundaries of the workday. Very admirable. How did you find yourself um, associated with the center? So when it first opened, there was a call for applications for people to work as career life um, navigators, uh, people who would be willing to talk to potential, you know, to new hires or to people who were considering a position here or to folks on campus about any um, issues they may have uh, in a confidential way. And that's really key. We don't talk to supervisors. We can't necessarily make decisions per se, but we can help connect, help them figure out who they need to talk to in HR, how to approach somebody with um, an issue, or we can share our experiences candidly um, with candidates who are on campus. I'm the parent of three children, uh, one of whom is autistic, and I felt like a place where people could hear uh, uh, others' experiences, how they navigated the school system, what they thought, what are some tricks about, so not tricks, like not trying to pull one over on people, but like what are some efficient ways of navigating HR if you need time off, if you you know, if you're faculty, what does that look like, for instance, because we have a decent amount of flexibility, a lot of us, but we still sometimes need a little more space to address um, health issues or caregiving responsibilities or what have you. And so I felt like because I had been working within the school district for a long time, advocating for my daughter, while also, you know, a member of the campus community that maybe other folks on campus might need that as a resource because there wasn't anything like that. And so I applied and, and um, I joined the center uh, in that capacity. Is that something that other folks who are interested may be able to do if they uh, are looking to get involved in a similar way? 
Um, there are just there are a couple folks who are who are navigators now, and I think periodically people will roll off and others might roll on. Um, we've had not as much demand during COVID because things have changed so much. Um, but during normal times, um, we do meet with a lot of candidates who come to campus for jobs and so on, just to kind of give our impressions of um, how things have worked here for us. Um, so I do think that's something that people could get involved in if there's an opening. But more importantly, I think people could reach out to the center, reach out to any one of us we're listed on the website. Um, if they have questions, if they need to know a little bit more about like, well, who, you know, who do you talk to if you think your kid needs an IEP or how do I, like, I've got this thing going on with my dad and I might need to take some time to, to care for him. What should I just start working remotely or how do I, I mean, does that count for FMLA? They can, people can come and talk to us um, for those kinds of issues. And the idea is that we can hopefully help them come up with a plan, point them in the right direction on campus um, or elsewhere and just provide that support um, so that people don't feel like they're going at it alone. And in this context, an IEP is an individualized educational program, which is designed for a single student. And a FMLA is the Family and Medical Leave Act. Correct. Yeah. So one of the things that as a parent of a disabled kid, I've gotten very used to speaking in acronyms, um, which sometimes needs translation if this is new to new to people. Um, so thank you for that. My uh, wife was a school teacher for some years, so I'm intimately familiar with those particular acronyms. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned COVID. Uh, that's a good segue. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what the center has been able to do for folks during the ongoing uh, pandemic and how the um, availability of more uh, virtual digital options has changed or had an impact on that? Sure. So, I mean, at first we kind of didn't really get much um, traction. We didn't have a lot of requests for people to meet with us because we had a hiring freeze. And a lot of folks were just focused on keeping their stuff going the best they could in the changing circumstances. But as that loosened up a little bit, we started getting requests to meet with candidates and, you know, other people virtually. And that actually was really beneficial because it was in some ways a little more efficient for both the person requesting the meeting or the person we were meeting with and ourselves. I think perhaps we got a little bit more uh, traction or attention paid to us because we could just open a Zoom link for 30 minutes and it could be done in the privacy of someone's home. Um, one of the things before COVID we were concerned about is, you know, would people, if they, if they wanted to talk to somebody about an issue with their department or an issue with somebody, would they want to be seen going into one of our offices? Would we need to meet somewhere else? But with Zoom, there was a degree of privacy that was afforded that I think made more folks perhaps be willing to reach out to us. And that made our availability a little easier for everyone. Just in the, in the next couple of weeks, I've got several visits, meetings coming up with candidates and other folks who some are in person, some are on Zoom, but it really allows for flexibility. Um, I think what we're doing now though, is trying to figure out what that flexibility looks like moving forward and what are some of the benefits, but also what are some of the drawbacks that we need to consider? And also how do people's individual circumstances change or have they changed now that perhaps children are back in school or um, aging parents are perhaps in a better place in terms of maybe they have more regular nursing care or are better able to access, um, you know, the grocery store or other things in the community. How do we then readjust to a new normal? And we haven't figured that out yet, but I know for a lot of us, um, what we're working on is trying to figure out what that balance looks like so that it supports individual folks on campus, but also so that it's equitable across campus as well. So looking into your crystal ball, cloudy though it may be, do you see some of these innovations that have come about during COVID as having lasting changes on the way you and the center uh, do your business, that balance that you were mentioning? I think for sure. I think we will definitely see a mix of both um, Zoom and in-person meetings moving forward. I think many of us have gotten used to the convenience of Zoom. I mean, we're meeting on Zoom right now. 
But in other instances, you know, there is something to be said for meeting face to face. So I think that's going to become um, very much a, a measure of personal preference and convenience. And it'll vary from person to person and circumstance to circumstance. But I'm glad we have that ability at this point. I suspect we're also going to see more folks who perhaps are trying to figure out a good balance between working from home or working virtually and the need to be um, present on campus. And some jobs lend themselves to that more than others. And figuring out how to negotiate those uh, parameters explicitly um, with you know, supervisors, with others, um, I think is something we're going to be seeing a lot more of. And individual circumstances may necessitate particular consideration given for some requests and not others. Full disclosure, I myself am on um, what's called intermittent uh, family and medical leave right now to help care for my daughter, which means that I don't always have to attend every meeting and so on, as long as I log that as as leave. Um, And so I think we're going to see maybe a little bit more of that approach as needed. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard to tell. I, I do suspect, though, many, many of my colleagues, myself included, I'm really glad to see campus come to life again in a lot of respects. So on a personal level, um, if, if you don't mind speaking on a personal level, of course, um, it sounds like you have found the additional flexibility that has been offered to be um, mostly uh, very positive. Well, quite frankly, I, I wouldn't um, be able to keep teaching my classes if I didn't have some additional flexibility, given um, how intensive some of my daughter's uh, therapies and caregiving um, can be. And so given the, the precedent with COVID, it sort of opened a space for, even though this is not COVID related, it opened a space to really talk about okay, well, you know, I don't need to be off 40 hours a week, but I probably need a couple hours to take my kid to an appointment or when I can't be in a meeting or whatever. And it opened up conversations for, okay, how do we do this? How do we establish uh, flexibility and an approach that fulfills both my work obligations, but also, you know, my kid is a bigger priority um, than perhaps attending a a small meeting in person when I could call in virtually. And luckily that was supported, but we did have to go through the process, right? So as a, as a, as a career life person, I don't actually make those decisions. I can help people figure out, well, here's what I did, or here's who you should talk to, or here's some of the options that you have, but ultimately other folks in HR or, or your supervisor has to kind of sign off on that but we can give advice on where to start. But with, with my flexibility and leave, um, it has actually alleviated a decent amount of stress and freed up time to go to conferences with my daughter's therapists while also having it be clear to my colleagues that, no, I'm not, you know, just kind of eating bonbons at home. Like there's a reason why I have to have uh, some time off. Uh, and I think that does help protect um, faculty and it helps uh, make it clear that such uh, uses of time and leave benefits and, and flexibility is not only okay, but appropriate and supported by others, um, which I think sends a good message. Yeah, it honestly sounds like that is a conversation that has needed to happen for some time. And yes. despite um, COVID's uh, dire and uh, ongoing cost, it sounds like one of the silver linings there is that it allowed that conversation to happen and for that space to be opened up. Yeah, I think it also meant that, you know, a lot of folks realized, well, maybe, you know, I do work better in my office, for instance, like, So I need to be there for X, Y, and Z. But I know um, if a student needs to meet with me virtually, I can do that hypothetically or vice versa. Well, maybe I do better if I have, you know, five hours a week that I needed to take on leave. And there's this whole process for how to do that. And then I'm going to 
make sure that I am present in my classes and so on, but having that ability to say, these are the hours I'm focusing on coordinating care opens up space for me to then focus on my academic work at other times. And so I think having those lines become clearer is a benefit of what's happened with COVID because we realize that there can be more flexibility, that there doesn't necessarily have to be a one size fits all approach, but we do need to approach things kind of consistently given people's situations, right? So that it's clear um, about, you know, you can get your work done, you can care for your, your family, but we have to make sure that, that, that we're in a conversation about that balance wow. for faculty and staff. It's opened up the ability to ask for more flexibility. And often, I've, I know not just myself, but several of my friends and colleagues have needed some accommodations and have been granted them. Um, and figuring out how to ask for that and advocate is really important. And I think that is a positive thing that's come from, from COVID. Fantastic. Um, do you have any advice for people who want to get in contact with the center? Um, it's on the website, so you can send an email or call, or you can directly email any one of us that's listed on the website, and we're happy to chat via email, meet on Zoom, meet in person, what have you. And again, it is completely confidential. Um, I am obviously very open, uh, and that's a strategic choice in some ways, very open about what we have to do to get my daughter appropriate care and, you know, her diagnosis and stuff, but we don't expect, I, I certainly don't expect everyone to do that, but I'm happy to chat with anybody if they need to talk to me. Thank you okay. so much, Kate, for your participation. Thanks. Bye-bye. Roundabout Oxford was developed and produced by Brian Corrigan, Taylor Fields, Sarah Catherine Glass, Brooke Gross, Alan Munchauer, Abigail Norris Davidson, Christina Streeter, and Alex Watson. This episode was narrated by Brooke Gross and Gail Herrera, with musical contributions from Gail Herrera and Brian Corrigan. Thank you for listening to Roundabout Oxford.